Um, I've got slides because actually we don't all hear, we don't all understand lots of language as well. So actually having some visuals as well, I think is quite important. My journey started 30 years ago. So when we talk about neurodiversity is new, it's not that new. Um, and 30 plus years ago, I was a GP and my middle child was diagnosed with dyspraxia. And then I went to school and everybody said, you mean dyslexia? And I had to learn that no, I didn't mean that. And I was told that he was gonna grow out of it. 35 years on, he's married with a child. And one of my other children has got a neurodivergent child as well. And we come from a really neurodivergent family. And he changed my life. My son changed my life. I changed my career. I was a, a GP and I set up a centre uh, for children and adults. Children to start with, because everybody told me they grew out of it. And then I realised they were carrying on growing up. Um, so 35 years on, I'm delighted to see we've got neurodiversity in business because it takes a while to get a movement to go together. It really does. So it's brilliant that we've got a room full of people. Now, I can't see what's on your screen now, so... Um, what is neurodiversity? Thank you very much, okay. So <laughs> this is a normal distribution, it's a bell curve, and actually neurodiversity is a social construct. It's about the people who are not in the room. It's about how we design education and how we design employment that fits those people who are average, but actually no one's average. I haven't met an average man or an average woman yet. Do you want to put on the next one? And this is really important that we need to start thinking about neurodiversity as everybody's business. It's about flattening that bell curve and opening the door to more people. We sometimes hear, and it really grinds me when I hear about people talking about the neurotypicals and the neurodivergence as if they are separate and divided. Actually, neurodiversity is all our brains. It's the way we think, move, act, and process information. And it isn't nice, and it's not neat, and it's really messy. And that people come with strengths and they come with challenges. And it's those spiky profiles and differences in sometimes the things you can do and the things that stop you being your best is the biggest challenge. The other thing I think I want to just challenge us all on is that it isn't about dyslexia, it's not about autism, it's not about ADHD. Our brains keep changing all through our lives and we're really messy. So we can start off being dyslexic and we can have Parkinson's later in life or we can have trauma or brain injury and we can have fetal alcohol syndrome. There's lots of different reasons why our brains vary and those neurological differences if the society isn't set up to include the process that allow you through the door don't allow you to be your best self and I think that's really important that we need to think about that and you know the news is true there are 84 billion brain cells they're connected in billions of different ways so why do we have 10 categories or 12 categories? We've got millions of different ways in each one of us, what we do, how we respond and how we get the best out of ourselves. And that's why everyone's business is, is so important. We need to be thinking about neurodiversity in the widest way. It's not about a single solution. It's about understanding each one of us. Now, we don't all succeed in business and not everyone gets a diagnosis and support. And I am really passionate that we try to think about the people who don't apply for jobs, that can't apply for jobs, that don't get through the door. I've got an eight-year-old who's brilliant at maths, he's great at computing, and I want him to get the best job ever. My grandchild, not, I haven't got an eight-year-old child. <laughs> that would be ghastly. Um, <laughs> So we, what we hear though, we do hear lots of stories about big business success, and I think that's great. And we're hearing a lot about talent as well. But I think if it is everybody's business, and we've got MPs in the room, where you've got constituents, where 99% of your businesses are small and medium enterprises, we've got, it's everybody's business. We need to open the doors. Now, the big businesses can lead the way. They can really show the good practice, and we can share that in our communities. And our brains, you know, going back to those brains, that's what we're talking about in a sense. You're lucky if you've got the right colour balls. That's your brain, I'm afraid to say. It's one of your brains, OK? And these are the colour balls in your bucket, which says you have to be bad enough to get a diagnosis. Until now, you've had to reach that threshold. And if you're not quite bad enough, that you don't quite reach the threshold, you don't get a diagnosis. It's an all or, what or nothing. And that can't be the, the, the way to go. The other thing, if you've got the wrong colour balls, it's bad news, right? So if you've got ADHD or you've got developmental language disorder, you've got something that people don't know about or not very well, you don't get identified. 
Now we've talked about the 20%, but with they, we've also got the ones who are hidden, the ones you don't see, the ones we don't talk about. And those are one in three in prison at least who are, have, are neurodivergent. We've just been screening 30,000 people in prisons recently. And what we've found is the people who are the most neurodivergent are those who've got the greatest cumulative adversity. So they're the ones who are often have been homeless, they've been in care, they've been excluded from school. Now, my grandchild is really fortunate. He's got an education healthcare plan, he's got support. He's getting support in school. But about 50% of children are excluded from school, and he could have easily been one of those kids, very easily. He can be quite a nu nuisance at times when he wants to get his, his uh, thoughts out, and, and, and he can be quite impulsive. One in two kids in, uh, who are excluded from school um, are neurodivergent. That's astounding, really. And for some of those, two thirds of males in prison have been excluded from school. So some of those are starting that school to prison pipeline. You're coming, you're, you've got constituencies across the country from the north to the south, and we've got some people, there are children on free school meals are more likely to be neurodivergent as well. And I just want to last, and I'm gonna hand over to my friend and colleague, Atif, is I like this phrase, because performance equals potential minus interference. And I really think is what we can do together, collectively, is to think about the interferences in people's lives that stop them performing their best. And that's why I think this is a great initiative if we work collaboratively together.